deeply into that. Focus on cloud, location, data center, industry, trends, the dynamic market. I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk, and I am so excited today to be joined by Overwatch CEO Kirk Affell. Kirk, thanks so much for joining. It's great to see you. Good to see you again, Dave. How's uh, things? You know, things are great. And before we start, like, man, props to you on just the incredible backdrop you have and some of the stuff that's back there. It's really cool, uh, really great stuff. But hey, before we before we jump into the data center industry conversation and some of the things that you're doing at Overwatch help uh, people that might not know who you are, like your background in the industry and how did you, you know, get to the point where a few years ago you said, Hey, I want to start uh, this company Overwatch. Yeah, no, good question. So uh, I guess, you know, I, my name is Kirk for those that don't know me. And, um, I am former Navy. In fact, that was my submarine right there, the USS Memphis. So <laughs> I was fortunate enough to work amongst some of the greatest people in the Navy, and I was an ET by trade, so I had a technical background. And when I left the military in 2000, um, my only focus was like, I got to go find a new purpose, right? And I think a lot of veterans transition out and they're like, okay, so I, I, I was so ambitious with my career in the military, and I built up all these things, and then I left, and now what? So I did what most transitioning veterans do, and I spent my time like I'll just plug myself into college. At least then I know I'm going the right direction and I have a skill set with my hands that allow me to do something. So I became a UPS service engineer and I did that while traveling, you know, 100, 150,000 miles a year until I graduated college. And the beauty about um, being a UPS service engineer is you're there during a lot of startups and commissioning. So you get, you get to watch and witness front row to all the IST and and that's where you really begin, you know, once you're immersed in that, you really begin to understand what are we building? Like, what is this small piece of a cog that I'm a part of? And then how does that grow into a, a bigger part? And I'm, I'm always been a fascinated person, you know, a closet nerd in some cases. So um, it was natural for me to go from active power, which is now pillar to Eaton. A lot of the same, you know, you know how this industry works. There's like a little pocket of people and they kind of all, you know, follow each other's management teams around the industry. I mean, uh -huh. what we've seen where, you know, they go and they kind of build their ranks around them. And, and I end up at Eaton. And um, the most unique thing happened to me when I was at Eaton is I was loving it. I was killing it. I was a project manager. And, you know, I was on this very homogenous career path. And next thing you know, I got, I kind of, I got blessed with cancer. So I ended up getting this super mm -hmm. rare form of cancer. And, um, you know, it's a whole entertainment of emotions. One of them was like, I was going to cut my leg off to, I had to figure out um, what I was going to do, you know, moving forward professionally. So I was in between, you know, surgeries at MD Anderson and I had to go get my stuff in order. And finally uh, one day, you know, I'm talking to my doctor and I'm like, well, look, if we remove this leg, how long can you guarantee that I could live as a result of that? And they're like, well, we can't guarantee anything more than two years. And it's like the light bulb went off in my head. And I just remember laying in that bed saying, I won't spend what could potentially be the last two years of my life being unhappy with what I'm doing. And not that mm -hmm. I didn't love eating. They were amazing. But I certainly wasn't satisfied with just doing that. I went from mm -hmm. driving submarines and jumping them out of the water and doing some of the most amazing, you know, I was employed 288 days a year on average with amazing leaders and amazing, you know, fellow sailors to now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a static environment where I have to work somewhere potentially for the rest of my life. So I just became massively curious. And I was like, if I'm going down in two years, my, my aptitude of this industry is going to be up to here. Right. So, mm. uh, I would interview. And every time I interviewed with companies, normally I would start with, I'm probably a little too disruptive to go be a part of your business. And I'm also only going to give you what could potentially be the best two years of my life. And if we're having a good run, then maybe I'll reenlist like I would mm -hmm. if I was in the military. If not, then I'm moving on to the next thing that's going to catch me and challenge me and allow me to continue to grow. So when you have this massive sense of urgency, you know, you don't take your foot off the gas at all. Mm -hmm. And things that you used to say, like, hey, man, I have to do this. Now you find yourself saying, hey, I get to do this. Or um, instead of saying, hey, I'm going to do that next year, you're saying, like, I'm going to do that next week. Like overdoing it is underrated. You know, moderation is for cowards, you know? So you're like, I'm <laughs> going to plow through all of this industry. So if you look, I started on the manufacturer side on the equipment and then, you know, grew my career to one of the largest, you know, electrical component manufacturers in the world. Then I got into the data center operator side with Cyrus One and that's just a whole nother ball game, right? I mean, 
even now they're still just an exciting group to work for but i got to work there with some of the most you know amazing people in this space you got to watch you know front row while guys like john hayden and laramie are you know building you know mega data centers at record pace and i ended up going to work for a general contractor so i went to work for nova mission critical it was just nova at the time we rebranded it mission critical and uh man it was we were building in everywhere but asia you know we were building in the mm -hmm. east we were building in europe all throughout you know the united states and um i was only there for a few years the the uh late chairman had passed and it was just time for me to transition on as that business was moving in a different direction and at the time i ended up uh i by blind luck ended up at a company called aligned energy and i got there right when they started making the changes to their entire c-suite so I got to be there when Raj came in as CFO and Shap and EJ and all those amazing guys that are over there. And there's still some, I got some great friends that are over at that group and there's some amazing people there, but I got to be a part of it where we had just one data center. Mm -hmm. And then um, we ended up getting Phoenix online and we ended up doing Salt Lake City and Virginia. And before you knew it, we were just, we were moving and, and, and jamming. And, and it was an amazing opportunity for me. But one day I sat down with Shap and said, hey man, I love you. I mean, you and I did a race with him once. So sure. You know, I still, he still mentors me and still coaches me up on things. And I consider him a friend and a resource. And I just remember saying, I'm like, look, this is an information, you know, and it was really a DCAC a few years ago where I was sitting there listening to these amazing speakers talk. And I'm like, man, I need to go be a part of something different. And at the time, I've always had this, this feeling that I think a lot of my fellow veterans have. And it is, what's my mission now? What is my purpose now? And I think having cancer turned a timer on for me. That was the only difference where I was like, okay, I have two years to figure it out. If I don't, then I'm moving on. And um, I think at the uh, that two-year mark, I sat down and said, hey, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I do know it's got to be my own thing. And I got to go figure out how to how to do something that where I feel inspired to do it every day. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel safe in the environment I work in. All the threats and dangers I have to deal with have to come from outside the business, you no know, politics. And part three is I had to go home fulfilled every day. And if I couldn't do that, then what kind of a husband or a father could I be or a coach or any of those other things, friends, yeah. son, whatever. So I spent all my time touching all the bases in baseball. You know, I think I, you know, I feel like I played outfield and infield and catcher. Sure. And now I get to, you know, be a GM. You know, I, I got an amazing team of people that are on the field for us now. And, and I get to kind of sit there and take all the things that I've learned by working for, you know, EYP when I was at HP or you know eaton or or cyrus one or nova as a gc and i get to aggregate all that and say hey let me tell you so when i bring on veterans and they're like hey this is what i want to do i'm like maybe but you don't know you don't know so i like to introduce them all those new things so that's sure maybe a long-winded long way around the horn on who i am and where i came from but uh my whole lineage is military my brother is my Heck dad yeah. i'm the youngest of a bunch of boys and it's just uh when you're former military man you're just used to change all the time yeah, I, I bet. What when? So you uh, Overwatch just hit two year anniversary. I was on your website earlier today, and so congratulations on that. That's awesome. Tell us, you know, about uh, maybe just like the current offering and where you're spending. You know, where you feel like you're spending most of your time because I think that's I think one of the really interesting things about your firm. What you're doing is, you know, you are right in the middle of the world's digital infrastructure being built. And um, and so, and, and in this time where we sit today with you know coming out of the pandemic and how much the industry has grown, uh, that's a really interesting place to be. So just talk about like Overwatch and where you're spending your time right now. Um, yeah, for sure. We, I agree. I don't think that there's a better place in our industry to be than right now than on the owner's rep side. Um, I get to see everything. Right. So I, uh, no joke, 50% of our customers are large enterprise, right? Big customers. Mm -hmm. The other half are some of the best data center operators on the planet, right? Our first customer was Crosby at, at Compass. And they, uh, I mean, talk about a, a, a guy that had a profound impact on me as a leader was Chris Crosby. I mean, we started this business, like you said, two years ago yesterday, you know, who would have predicted four months into this, you know, there's this massive global pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the world is on fire. It's a dumpster fire. And, you know, I'm sitting here with, I think at the time we had 11 employees, we were operating in two, three countries. And I'm just like, what 
are the chances, you know, I'm doing what everybody else is doing. Google statistics on startups, you know, why do startups fail? You know, and it wasn't coming back with the, you know, lack of innovation or, you know, it was like, um, well, you could have an offsetting world event that could definitely be catastrophic. So for us, um, we started this brand and, you know, today we sit at just about 30. We're just under 30 people. We operate in three soon to be four countries. Half of our staff is former military. The other half are civilians that are, they have a paramilitary type culture, extremely selfless individuals in nature. They come to work, they either lead or be led. And, and they are humble, hungry, and smart, right? They come in and they're like, look, there's not a person here. Like we hire transitioning veterans from different backgrounds than what we normally see in our space from a military background. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'll go into that in a little bit, but like for us, we get to sit at the front line to see who wins and, and, and coming from the manufacturer side and working through the ranks as a consultant, you know, on the consulting engineering side to the owner's side, to the GC side, back to the owner side, it's always been this massive push and pull, right. Where, um, you know, there's this big race to get to the bottom and see if you get to the cheapest price per megawatt. And now I see, and we started seeing this shift when I was in the line and we're continuing to see the shift now, but it's never been as prevalent as it is right now where you're seeing the manufacturers or the ecosystem of partners that build these things. You've never seen them have such a profound impact on who mm-hmm. gets to win and lose these deals. So think about it like this. In certain NFL cities, there are, it's an oligopoly, right? So there's some groups, publicly traded REITs, some are you know now private or going private. They all have massive, I mean, the biggest change in our space has been volume, velocity, massive size of deals, more of them in markets we normally never went into, like West Jordan, Utah, you know, um, sure. San Antonio is yeah. obviously exploding. And even Austin, where I live now, I mean, we're seeing major, I mean, uh, you saw what Switch is announcing. There's going to be some major um, activity out here. You know, we're, we're hearing all kinds of other things going on in here in orbit. So you're seeing these major programs. And I remember when like six megawatts used to be a big deal. Sure. And now there's operators like, mm, we don't, you know, we pick our teeth with those, yeah. right? So <laughs> throw those over the fence, the retail guys. Yeah. So what you're really seeing though, is when you have these major deals, like obviously I'm sure everyone's aware of the major programs that are going down in Dallas and the Pacific Northwest and Virginia with one of the larger hyperscalers. Think about that, right? So they, they're going to have to go buy hundreds of pieces of gear and those manufacturers they get to pick winners. They're going to be like, mm, well, that group didn't pay us that well, or they always beat us up. So their lead times are Q1 of 2023. However, this group has always been a consistent customer, treats us like a partner. We could probably get theirs. They get headline privileges. They get theirs by the end of Q3, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Q3, Q1, a lot of disparity, but that's yep. where wins and losses come. Yep. So yep. we're seeing some crazy shifts. That's the advantage of sitting in the front row. Um but that's, I mean, that's just a byproduct of what we do. You know, we have, like I said, about 30 folks now. We're in three, four countries. And uh, our first customer um, was Compass Data Centers. And Compass, I got to give a lot of credit to, and I probably don't do this enough. I have to give them credit for helping us discover and refine our, our mission or, or our purpose. We knew that we wanted to build a team of military people that, um, come from a different mission critical background, right? So if you look at my chief of staff, who, former Navy SEAL, and my two top executives, uh, both Army, one's an Army infantry officer, one's Army infantry enlisted. I think between the three of them, we're talking, you know, three, four Bronze Stars, three, four Purple Hearts, and, you know, countless gunfights and battles. And their version of mission critical is measured in mortality, not downtime mm-hmm. in seconds. So, they don't get rattled as easily. They're not typically, uh, they don't over rotate emotionally as much. They're slow, smooth, smooth, fast. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have this tribe that we built and we didn't think it's like the same reason why we built DCAC. I didn't think the industry needed another industry conference. I just felt it needed a better one. And there are amazing owners rep groups in our space. I didn't think that we needed another one. I just felt that we needed a one that had a better mission, a better purpose. And our purpose was, we knew that we were going down the right path. I knew that I was unfulfilled, you know, in every every job I had prior to that because I wasn't, you know, I, I don't feel like I was a part of a bigger mission or command. And then when I created our own, we knew that our only mission was 
to provide purpose to veterans. So, you know, I have a, a nuclear submarine background, the Air Force Power Gen Pros, you know, there's certain groups of us in the mil- in this industry that come from the military that come from prevalent pockets, right? But the thing that I'm the proudest of is when, when we sat down with Compass, Compass said, hey, we have this huge need and we're really focused on, I've not seen a group more focused on diversity, right? And as a father with a daughter, like I'll put all the, you know, the wood behind the arrow for a group like Compass that's focused on giving more opportunities to the women in our space. And that's, mm. that's something I think I've seen. Like some people were asking me like, what's some of the biggest changes you've seen? I'm like, go to DCAC. 30, 40% of our, our attendance was female, which mm-hmm. if you look at the first year I did it, it was yeah. maybe 10, 15, <laughs> sure. right? So there's people coming into this space and those people are making a difference, right? A lot of those people are making a difference. I, I don't know what the statistics are, but I, we don't measure even higher based on statistics, but I would say a lion's share of the people that make the biggest impact on our, in our business come from our field side. And, and I would say a large part of them are women. Right. But uh, Compass helped us create uh, something that we now it's referred to as Ovita, which is the Overwatch Veteran in Transition Apprenticeship. And we take people coming out of the military that don't have any Navy nuke or Air Force Power Gen Pro background. We're hiring, uh, I think our very first was an aviation boatswain's mate, right, on mm-hmm. an aircraft carrier. She launched like 150,000 planes. We've hired, um, from the Marine Corps, I mean, I have from every branch of service, Air Force, mm-hmm. well, everyone but Space Force. So Coast Guard, Air Force, Army, Navy, Marine. We have people that come from security background. They were MPs. We have people that were damage control men on the Coast Guard. They didn't have necessarily what would be the most typical background technically from uh-huh. their MOS or their NEC or their professional career in the military. They didn't have a transitioning, you know, role or rate that went, oh, well, that's easily identified. Put them on a, you know, they could probably, they could draw primary and secondary nuclear propulsion. Let's put them on a submarine or from a submarine onto a four bus distributed redundant, you know, data center design. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like that. These are people that had to really start from nowhere. And we found that we were able to unleash like a whole nother beast of people. And mm. I think if you watch what like, uh, you know, I, I read, I'm an avid reader, as I know that you are, I've listened to your podcast. Um, the existential threat in our, in our industry, right? You could ask anybody, they'll all tell you. It's, it's really the shortage of labor, right? Mm-hmm. The, the growth, we as the consumers are driving more of the adoption rate of technology, which is having this massive growth spur, you know, spike. Mm-hmm. And the only limiting factor to delivering more capacity is there's just simply either not enough people or not enough parts to do more, right? So we're moving in, you know, high speed, low drag already, and it's not slowing down. So we felt like, uh, again, I didn't think that the industry needed, you know, another owner's rep firm. I just felt like we were, we weren't tapping into like college is great, but it's just not enough. And where are the trades pulling from and what's the limit of that? And how does that scale? Whereas we have, you know, two, 2000 veterans transitioning out of the military every month, soldiers, sailors, and airmen. Mm. And many of them, I mean, they, they've, I've always believed that our industry doesn't lack in any way, genius or intelligence, tons of big fat brains running around here. Mm-hmm. You talk to half of them on your show all the time, right? So <laughs> our industry lacks leadership. It lacks courage. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that, you know, we as Overwatch being nerds, like we are and being on the front lines of all these data centers on both the enterprise side, as well as the data center side, you know, we get front row it unleashing all this, you know, the, you know, the, the technology stacks, you know, the home for the cloud, I guess we get to unleash all those, those boxes that serve as these cathedrals for all these emerging technology stacks. For us, we love being a part of that because we know that we're having an impact on everyone around the world. These technologies in theory sure. make lives better. However, yeah. the only way for us to fully get to the point where we can hit our potentials in industry is to untap, um, is to leverage an untapped resource, which I think can only be found in the military, right? It's um, it's the veteran community. I'm not saying, you know, our civilian counterparts aren't amazing, but there's something about someone who once took an oath and raised their hand and promised to protect and defend something up to and including their own life, 
if necessary, including the person to the left or the right of them, right? So, you know, soldiers, sailors, and airmen, they're not politicians. They they have a very strong code. And, and I have found that the amount of just, you know, unfiltered love that they have for each other allows them to be more productive. Yeah. Right. So for us, I felt like the only way to us, for us to hit our, our productivity maximum would be to create a culture um, that really allowed people to uh, discover different things. Cause we don't know. I mean, when you're coming out of the military, like me, I, I may have at one point been like, I'm going to be a project manager for life. This is amazing. I'm getting good at this. But my performance and how well I was able to do with that was not aligned to my passion, right? So at least here as an owner's rep, we get to we get to give them different options and yeah. get, introduce them at different altitudes and airspeed and be like, look, maybe this isn't for you. Maybe this is for you. And, and in doing that, we know that the reason why purpose is our only mission is because they're... Uh, there's about 8,000 soldiers, sailors, and airmen that we've lost since September 11th. We've lost 160 plus thousand since they've come home from combat. Mm. And the scary and growing trend that has a huge impact on our business is the suicide rate amongst our fellow veterans. Mm-hmm. If you look back and understand like, why? Why are such amazing people leaving the military with amazing backgrounds and they can't find happiness and fulfillment in their mm-hmm. life? You know, what next? What now? They were mm-hmm. amazing what they did in the military, ranked amongst the top. They left. And now what? Right. So that's why you have, you know, according to the Department of Veterans Affairs, you know, still north of 20 veterans that kill themselves every day. Mm-hmm. So for us, if we could create an environment that is beneficial to the mission critical vertical, where we could cross train people coming out of the military, regardless of what their technical background was, and really repurpose anybody. Yeah. And what we can do is we can find purpose for veterans and with that we could do our part to end the cycle or slow the cycle of veteran suicide so that's our number one focus that's why we created the Ovita program is to just get the greenest of veterans coming out of the military and you know if it wasn't for customers that treat us like true partners like compass data centers yeah. we wouldn't have been able to stand that program up so they probably i mean we have amazing customers not a single one of them is short of being exceptional but I don't know if anybody's done as much to help the veteran community for us personally than, you know, compass. So yeah, that that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. And real, I, yeah. Really encouraging. I mean, I just think about, you know, obviously being in this space, but with a greater mission. Um, and that's just, it's fun to see. And, uh, do you, is, uh, is the, is one of the hardest parts or maybe it is the hardest part of, of transitioning or from your experience and maybe working with as many veterans as you have, like, transitioning out of the military into something else? Is it really just connecting with a, another purpose? I mean, you've obviously talked about how purpose is so important. Is that really, I mean, when you look at all the challenges, would you say that's the main one or one of the main ones? Yeah. Yeah. Can I, uh, 1000%. So let me, can I share another story with you? Yeah, sure. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a commercial. So if I am just show me, down. <laughs> all good. um, you know, when I came out of the military, I came out, uh, I'm not saying I was, anything special, but I had done well, right. Where I was recognized by my command and I had accelerated throughout everything that I had done. And I had come out with a great sense of pride. And then I was like, I don't know how this equates to anything else in the civilian fleet. Right. So I knew, I knew that I just go to school and I'd figure out stuff and I would discover as long as I kept my eyes open and kept looking, I would discover what that, purpose would be for me as long as I didn't, you know, go backwards. So, you know, continuing my education, introducing myself to another industry and trying to be a student of that industry mm-hmm. and still am. Right. Um, I mean, there's not another industry that reinvents itself as aggressively. This is our space. So it was perfect for me because there's nothing static. Everything's explosively dynamic. Our industry is shifted from best design to best, this, to best, that, to, it's all relationship driven, social mm-hmm. dynamics and chemistry drive a lot of the needle. So for us, you know, I look back now and go, what I want to be the leader that I wish I had when I got out of the Navy in 20, you know, and, 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 you know, 21 years ago, which is, I wish I had a paint by numbers thing that said, Hey, this is what you have to do. Just go execute. Mm-hmm. Because traditionally when you leave in the military, that's the one thing they do teach you. They teach you how to learn. They teach you how to execute. Mm-hmm. So for me, 
I was like, I wish someone had just told me like, Hey, this is the playbook pay by numbers, do this. I mean, think about it as when we were kids, uh, go to school, get good grades, get good grades, go to good college, go to good college, get a good job, get a good job, make some money, make some money, be happy. Right. But I mean, that homogenous thing, I wish there was something equivalent to that as transitioning veterans are coming out. They're like, okay, so what's next? There's really no beacon, Mm -hmm. right? It's you kind of like, well, I'm going back to where I came from, or I'm, I have an aunt or an uncle, or I have friends here and someone I know here. I'm going to school because I'm not sure what I want to do. And finally, I was like, you know, we're sitting here watching this space grow and we're watching projects stall because there's not enough. I mean, you're watching major programs in Virginia where they're like, well, I need two electrical contracting teams, one for just the inside and one for the outside, just because the scope is so massive, mm-hmm. right? That we need more bodies. We have to stack them on top of each other. So I'm looking at this and I'm hearing this existential threat and there's not enough labor. And I'm like, wait a second, we have 2000 soldier sailors sure. in the military every month. Who's actively going out and trying to find them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you go out and you have those conversations and people are like, yeah, yeah, we need bodies and it's great. And there's military headhunters. And I'm like, yeah, there are. And then finally, you know, I've stumbled on, um, there's an electrical contractor and they're one of the biggest in our space. And they probably um, do work with almost every, major data center operator or enterprise end user around the world in some form or fashion. And um, they're like, look, we need to hire a thousand bodies next year. I'm like, mm-hmm. good luck, you know, and they're unions. So I'm like, what are you going to do? Yeah. You can only go scratch the, the pain in those union halls so much. And finally I'm like, how come you guys don't just go and make a targeted effort in hiring transitioning veterans, every branch of service, this is electrical contracting company. Every branch of service has electricians or electronics, you know, electrician mates or electronic mm-hmm. technicians or some, some permutation where they, they have enough technical background where they can maybe enter the apprenticeship program. And um, it was probably a conversation that went back and forth for a few months. And finally, I was talking to Justin Tinoco at Rosenden. And, and I said, how about I go find you 500 transitioning veterans and those 500 souls that you find a new purpose for. And they come in and they probably run circles around most people that you're used to seeing because when you're in the military, I mean, when I was in port, I was working hundred hours a week, you know, let alone when I was at sea. Right. So, sure. you know, I'm like, these people are probably used to not what you're used to. They are not trying to trivialize or downplay what their, what their overall total earning potential should be. But I can tell you this, no one's in the military to make money. They're there to make a difference. Right. And to be a part of something bigger than themselves. So I said, Justin, um, if Rosen wants 500 transition veterans, we can, we can go find them. We'll host our own conferences on, you know, military bases, but you have to go give them a purpose. You can't just give them money and a title and then not have them be a part of something or they're going to leave your retention mm-hmm. will be gone. And he went back and forth. And I mean, to the credit of Rosen, um, they leaned in hard and they believe in, and not just, you know, they need these, they need talented individuals that are selfless in nature but they want to make an impact on the veteran community. So, I mean, they signed up to hire 500 transitioning veterans in 2022. So we're putting together, you know, we're in contact with, you know, Naval Station San Diego right now. They got eight bases there, thousands of sailors. We're going to go start being a part of those, those events at those bases, or we'll host our own just so we could start trying to find 50, 70, 100 transitioning veterans a month and go give them a new mission and a new purpose. Sure. And in doing that, we'll solve the existential threat of the industry, yeah. but we're also going to save some lives. Yeah. One less veteran likely to do something um, because they grow, you know, in silent desperation, you know, because their anxiety yeah. might be no yeah. transition. So uh, if we give them purpose, it'll be amazing. Sadly for me, I had to stumble my way through the industry, collect a little bit of cancer along the way before I was able to discover like, this is, how I discovered it. And I think that it's my duty and my responsibility to go try to figure out a, a pain by numbers roadmap for our fellow veterans, because I think that our industry uh, is going to need more talented people that have um, more, not more courage, but a different type of courage. They're used to dealing with, if you worked on a submarine like I did and you had to strip down to your dungarees and tie a rope around you and climb behind the RCP and work on live gear, then I mean, we literally had people standing there with sound power phones to pull us off the gear if we got electrocuted. That's a different level of stress than, sure. than some of the things that, you know, the civilian counterparts have to deal right with. Right on. 
No, absolutely. Okay, so let's let's shift gears a bit and talk about DCAC. So if if people that are listening, if you've been to this conference, you know it is different than you know your normal industry data center industry conference. It's, it's uh, you know it's like edgy. It's really fun. Uh, you, you know, there's been different guest speakers that are like non-traditional <laughs> guest speakers, which we won't get into all that, but, but, you know, a lot of fun there, but so y'all just hosted it this last couple or, you know, a couple of months ago, um, you know, from your standpoint, what were some of the like key trends or takeaways that you came away with? Um, and, you know, for those of you know, that, that, that don't know, I mean, Kirk founded this, he's built a team around it. Um, you know, this is one of the many things that he does during the year, but kind of like from your standpoint, what were the, the takeaways from that conference? Uh, just kind of from an industry standpoint. Yeah, no, good question. Thanks for asking. It's funny you ask because this was our sixth year, right? And um, I would say it's the first year where I feel like we've arrived. You know, I mean, as good as that sounds, but I mean, we, again, like anything else, we were just stumbling around. We knew we were going the right direction with this event. And we, you know, we went back and forth on venues. We've gone back and forth on formats where I, you know, I had panels to, I did one year like a TED talk where it was just individual powerhouses and they weren't talking about traditional emerging compute stacks that we saw um you know really driving the growth of our vertical we were talking about we were bringing groups to talk about stuff that's less prevalent but would have a major impact on us and we had amazing speakers like i gotta tell you you know I, there's too many good people to list and i know if i tried i would miss a few but we just kind of got a little bit better each year Right. And we just now are finding our stride, I think, to where it's the right balance. We shifted back to ACO and we really uh, focused hard on not we didn't find topics. We just found people that we felt mm -hmm. that were provocative or disruptive or, you know, they were outliers in some space and they had a vision or they have a goal and there's a disconnect. You know, I remember having this conversation with Dean Nelson, right? I was like, you know, it was like Joe Cava, Dean Nelson, Peter Gross on a call, and we were talking about a panel. And think about it. I mean, you have the GOAT and, you know, hall, if this was a sport, two additional Hall of Famers of our sport, and they're right. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, you guys are talking about these things like it's so easy, these visions to bring to life. I go, but they're not. And I'm like, it's not like they're super approachable. Not that we see them, they're prevalent. But I said, guys, you got to break it down to where there's a bridge, you know, that connects the audience to you so that, because I mean, it may be their vision, but they're not bringing it to life. The team that's sitting there in the audience will do it, which is the architects, the engineers, the brokers that buy and sell the land, the builders, all the people that supply equipment and manufacturing, let alone the labor and the trades, right? So those are the people, as well as the enterprise and users that occupy that space. So for us, we really used it to try to build a gap between, you know, if, every profession has celebrities, right? These are our celebrities. And I'm trying to say like, Hey, how does Joe Blow, who, who has something that's awesome. That's just not as prevalently known help contribute to you bringing that vision of yours to life. Right. And, and <clears throat> I think it was a great first time where they really leaned in. It used to be like, we'd have big powerhouse speakers come, you know, they hang out in the green room until it's their time, they get done and they plug out. Right. But now we had them just, they stayed omnipresent the whole time. And I think one of the things that really brought it to attention was like Dean flashed stuff up there that just talked about the direction of the industry as a whole. And I think that it was the first time that some people had heard those things. Mm -hmm. and it was the first time they were able to connect with that meant this massive emerging growth in our space to what they do. Mm -hmm. And once they understood how it impacts them, then you could see them leaning in. Mm -hmm. And and then you also saw the speakers getting more excited because of that engagement. And sure. you had less people getting up and running to the back and checking their phones. You had more people that are, I mean, the, the people were sitting the whole time and they were listening and there, I mean, it was really obvious to us that people wanted to be outside or be amongst people, despite the risk. Sure. Like we, I bought, I bought thousands of masks. I think I, you know, I got almost all of them back. We left them out. No one wanted to use them. Mm we had people that, you know, got COVID and, you know, it was one of those things where like, Hey man, I got it, but I'm good. It was great to see you. Peace out. Just letting you know in case anybody else got it. It was like, it wasn't shut down the space type of thing. And I mean, I, I don't know. I think maybe we even broke our own attendance record. So we had great speakers. It was disruptive content. 
Peter Gross probably scared everybody when he talked about how AI is going to be able to hack anything in five years from now or something <laughs> like that. He's like, yeah, don't even bother. He's like, we'll all be back in analog by then, you know, but <laughs> maybe I'm overgeneralizing what he said, but yeah, man, I mean, the future of AI is super scary, super scary. Mm-hmm. And that became, you know, very prevalent. And it was something that was discussed. It wasn't just discussed on stage. I can't tell you how many people come up to me or text me later and be like, was that for real? You know, like, is he serious? Where do you think he gets that from? So I'm like, I oh, will get you more data. Right. But it was cool because that's what you want. You want that yeah. stuff out there. And I didn't, I didn't want to give them topics to talk about. I sure. mean, don't get me wrong. I don't want to trivialize sustainability and all those other things, modularity. And, but like, I really wanted to see what these people that are really interesting and exciting. I want to see what they want to talk about. What are they passionate about? And, um, and it was exciting for me to see that, you know, we're still making advances in the way that we design and, and build data centers. Um, it was amazing to see how much the manufacturing partner or the manufacturing ecosystem, they're just struggling. And they're not mm-hmm. struggling because they're not doing it right. They're struggling because it's a byproduct of the ripple effects of the global pandemic, mm-hmm. logistics and shipping. And But let me tell you, man, I mean, the demand for technology didn't go south yeah right? it I mean, didn't change yeah we were already like, increased only, yeah yeah we were at a double digit keg i don't know which rags you guys refer to but i mean like we were what at least a 20 point you know compound annual growth rate is a vertical and then all of a sudden the adoption rate of technology spikes yeah. you know even more as a result of this i mean our industry was massively growing while while a lot of stuff was kind of in a holding pattern so it was crazy to see the, the theme of the entire event for me on stage was advanced technology with bigger programs, smaller footprints, higher densities. I mean, it's just been the same thing. It's just more of it. Right. And then new markets. But um, there was a lot on the I think there was a time where diversity was one of those things that people did to check a box. But now we're really seeing what the diversity means. Like, like I said, we saw 30 percent of our attendance was diverse based, you you have female, whatever. And if you think about that, that's a huge voice and they bring completely different perspectives to what we do. So you can sit down with one person that's been doing it a certain way. And then the voice that you may not have heard from as much. And they're from the outside looking in and and they're like, yeah, man, have you thought about this mean or this method or this alternative product of steel or whatever? And, And when you're done, we just had a better exchange, right? So it was really cool to see not just diversity being spoken about, but seeing the impacts and the value that the diversity drives and brings. Um, and I saw that the other theme is, is everybody's struggling for more talent, right? So hmm. if they're in the labor, they're, they're, they're looking for more, more people, which again, parlays perfectly into our mission and our purpose, right? We're, we're not trying to be the best owners rep firm in the world. We're just trying to have the biggest impact on our community uh, on both communities, the veteran community, by helping do our part to lower the suicide rate amongst our fellow veterans, and two, help have the biggest impact in solving the existential threat in the industry by tapping an untapped resource of talent. We find them in here, we discover them. I run into fellow veterans all the time, but it's not like is it's not like someone stopped and did what Rosen's doing and saying, you know what? They they created Operation Spark, Operation Spark, their electrical contractor. Let's go find 500 veterans and put them to work in the field, multiple markets. And that's half the growth of their labor force. They'll need what, 1200 bodies next month or next year. So like, that's a huge commitment. I haven't seen a single company in our space make a commitment of that magnitude, Hmm. right? So now you're seeing what was once big and audacious now becoming a vision of something that needs to be driven through to full reality, right? So there's a huge need for talent. And I mean, we have two major hyperscape, we have we have four large hyperscale customers, but two of the biggest ones. And they're they're talking about, you know, tying sustainability and labor challenges together mm-hmm. by going and, you know, maybe buying an old manufacturing facility that was shut down or abandoned and and building a ton more stuff in that in a modular fashion, you know, mm-hmm. and regionalizing it so that they could they can really leverage their supply chains easier and find more, you know, labor to work on certain things and you know, they're rescuing a distressed asset that they could repurpose, which is in itself something good for all of us, right? And and they're doing it because at the same time, it, you know, the aesthetic environment improves their QA or sure. gives them a more predictable result in their delivery. So 
it's just crazy to see it all come together. But what I am seeing is I'm seeing a greater emergence of, it used to be like the biggest change used to be what? Then the amount of money coming into our space, mm-hmm. right? There used to be only a few people that were really investing in this vertical. Now sure. everybody has money yeah. in the space. <laughs> so you don't even know who they are, right? I mean, people will come up and we get asked questions all the time and we're like, I get it. You guys have a ton of money, but are you prepared for this? This yeah. is a completely different ball game than building a, a warehouse, right? So that used to be the biggest change. Now the biggest change is I'm watching the ecosystem pick partners. I'm watching the ecosystem pick winners on operators because they're like, mm. I mean, I've literally watched multiple partner groups just decide like that's that operator hasn't been playing nice for a while. Let's go help our other operator win this deal and we'll make sure they win it based on schedule. Right. So it's just, I'm seeing this shift of power, you know, and that's what I'm seeing. I mean, quite frankly, I'd be interested to see if you're seeing that as well. Yeah. I think the scale uh, of these projects and the challenges that the timelines have created to your point really uh, present different opportunities for things like that to take place. You know, that, that traditionally, I mean, you brought up the term six or the six megawatt size earlier, you know, it's like, I mean, when I first started in this space, I feel like that was, you know, those were some of the biggest deals we were seeing, you know? Yeah. And it's like, and so there's just been such a radical shift in the way that in the, the, the problems that these companies are having to solve, you know, and, and how they're choosing to do that on like a long-term basis. So, uh, but to your point, I, I, I agree. It is, it is very interesting to watch this demand get pushed and placed in certain, you know, geographies with certain data center operators. And based on what we're, we're seeing as it relates to like demand and things like that, it doesn't, it doesn't appear there's like a slowdown. So you also mentioned, uh, you know, t- the technology footprints uh, evolving, getting smaller, higher density, those those type of aspects. And and then on top of that, there's the, you know, uh, the, the continual growth and usage of data by companies and consumers. And that that is like trumped all of the technology advancements that we've seen. And so it's just created these demand footprints that are so incredibly big. And that has been, you know, we... I was to tell our team all the time. I feel like we've been on like a growth, like a demand rocket ship, just watching it. It's been fascinating from our standpoint to track the industry. Yeah. And you have probably even have a better view than we have, right? Cause you're seeing all of it holistically and I'm seeing pockets of it. Um, you know, I don't think that we've hit a plateau yet on what yeah. the adoption rate of technology is going to be until we see like, you know, maybe the third quarter of next year when, you know, Apple rolls out their, you know, their, their glasses or, you know, when we start using consumer wearable devices and we're aggregating even more data, even in secondary, you know, third tier markets, I still think that you're going to see densities continue to go higher footprints getting not necessarily smaller, but just scaling. It's changing. Yeah. But you know, what's crazy is schedules, everything. I mean, like things, right. KPIs are always safety of humans, schedule, budget, like, like you, you don't win bonus points if you got your project done on budget and on time, but you sent someone home in an ambulance or you didn't get the chance to send them home at all. Right. For us, there's certain buckets that, you know, come into priority mm-hmm. schedule is, I mean, safety of humans is still going to be number one, but schedule is tied with it probably. Right. Because mm. a lot of these deals that people are chasing, they're not six megawatt deals anymore. They're 60 megawatt deals. Yeah. And those are uh, real programs with real capital and a lot of muscle and a lot of attention. And now you're not seeing, like it used to be, remember it was, oh, I can't get my transformers in time. I can't get my generators in time. I can't get my UPSs in time or my batteries. Uh Uh-uh. You know what's holding up programs now? Um, Roofing material, PVC pipe, door frames and hardware, 24 week lead times. Yeah. You're like, wait a second, what? You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) it's just you're seeing things change and you're watching some of these, some of these manufacturers are okay. We already knew that the procurement teams for these operators and enterprises, they're so massively sophisticated, they're armed to the T, right? Well, the manufacturers are getting pretty smart too, Mm -hmm. right? And they're like, hmm, okay. Hey, listen, um, how about net X payment terms instead of net 30? Or, you know, they're like, they're figuring out ways to, to, 
to make it more accretive for themselves. And I think that what you'll see is this race to the bottom that a lot of operators were in, like, I got to get below what Cyrus one was building at or, you know, whatever. Now it's, it's just like, I think that that's no longer the bragging focus. People are like, cool, you make it really cheap, but you just can't make it on time. Right. So mm-hmm. like, what do you want to do? You don't get both. Right. Yeah. So you want to do large volume scale. You want to be able to do it fast. Cool. Well, then you have to abandon a few ideas and you're going to pay or suffer a little bit of an inconvenience or a premium on cost. But that comes out of their margin. You know sure. what I'm saying? So yeah. What's the return? Right. Which is, I think, the pressures that you saw from that are what's forcing groups that are like mm, being publicly traded, you know, mission critical read, not as much fun as it used to be, probably. Yeah. So- yeah. That is, yeah, that's been interesting to watch as well. The changes with the, the publicly traded companies and the privately owned companies and the competitiveness between the two. So, okay. So let me ask you this kind of in closing, you know, you're two years into, to overwatch, um, you know, you've got this mission to keep hiring, uh, you know, veterans that are transitioning out of the military and looking for their next mission. Um, you've got a data center conference that you host that's going on. I mean, you, you are doing a lot of things. What, from your standpoint, what gets you most excited about the next three to five years in this space? Yeah, good question. I tried to think about that one a little bit. Um, so for me, it's selfishly like I see, I see a lot of people getting really focused on what they need to do, right? I mean, we, there's so much skill. There's so much, so many talented people in our space. I mean, you've been to these conferences and you get to talk to some of these amazing people. Like, I am just as stunned by the amount of talent I see in our spaces, I saw in a submarine, right? Like I, I didn't work for a single person that was a bad person or <laughs> lacked any intel. I mean, they were just geniuses. I see that here, but what I'm seeing is what um, there used to be a lot of disparity between those of the big fat brain that were like the quarterbacks or led the herd. And then you had not sheep, but you had people that were just kind of like, if they're saying then that's a good idea, then I'm following. Now I'm seeing a much more educated overall mass. Do you, does that make sense? Yeah. And people that used to show up and they were, you know, they started as a low voltage structured cabling person and they're now working for an operator themselves or they're, you know, working for a GC or something, but I'm now seeing everyone kind of educate and get ramped up together. So think about it. We incrementally shift at a much higher altitude and airspeed than most other industries. And it takes someone that's really driven from the inside to try to understand how to analyze and interpret these market trends and why should I pay attention? Mm-hmm. These conferences are offering those things. Some of them are very homogenous where, you know, it's the same thing, just different market. You show up and if you have enough money, people will listen about your stuff, but there are things that are being changed. And some of these conferences are like, wait a second, what you do and how you do it is just fascinating as hell. But why do you do that? Mm-hmm. And help us understand so mm-hmm. that we can buy into that program too and help you be more successful in what you're doing. So what I am seeing and what I'm most excited about is I'm seeing so much more talent just like pouring into our space right Mm -hmm. from places that are untapped in the past. Mm -hmm. And I'm also seeing them, um, not just them, but those that are on the diversity side that maybe weren't part of the old, you know, the old boys club or whatever you want to call it. But now they have a voice and they get to drive change too. So when I look at this, I see um, it used to be a very small group of people that, you know, kind of controlled what the market was doing and i'm seeing that you know that power to be able to shift and change industries being distributed to so many people and it's balancing out the industry right so you have some groups that it used to be like if you had the money you have the power now it's not that it's if you have the customers you have the power right so mm-hmm. um i'm seeing these trains crazy shifts and you'll just see things kind of continuously get reconciled along those fronts until we get to a much more sustainable, I mean, we whipsaw, this industry whipsaws, you see it, right? Massively cyclical. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to see, I think, I, I believe that what we'll see is more talent pour into this space. And as a byproduct of that, you're going to see um, less over rotations and you'll see um, our industry become more stabilized in terms of how fast we could build these things and then which markets are most accretive for us to continue to expand into. So I just see us morphing transformation from not a technology perspective, but from a collective, there's people getting educated, like, you know, DCAC, uh, well, you know, obviously we'll do it again this year, but 
don't be surprised if I'm doing a podcast one day and I'm bringing, you know, the Scott note booms or, you know, the Peters or whoever, you know, there's, there's people that are making major changes to this space. But the thing that I found is the ones that are super smart, they're actually thinking of these crazy things. They don't give a shit about explaining it to people. They're just so focused on their ideas that someone still has to break it down. Right. Sure. That's what DCAC hopefully does is it gives them a form to where a guy like you or, you know, someone, I'm not going to say like me, but someone else that kind of can, you know, mosey around the space a little bit can ask some questions and draw them out and get below the surface. Yep. No longer just scratching the pain on the industry. Like people are contributing to change that fall outside of the normal circles. That's does good. That yeah, totally. Kirk, thank you for taking the time to meet and uh, connect on this podcast. You know, we behind your mission, a hundred percent, so excited for your success and, uh, you know, listen, anytime somebody starts something and they get to that first year, they get to that second year. I mean, that's just uh, worth celebrating. And so congratulations to you and your team. If I, I think the, the website is weareoverwatch.com. So if people are listening and you want to learn more about what Kirk and his team uh, and their mission and what they're doing, you can go to that. It's weareoverwatch.com. Uh, and obviously Kirk's on LinkedIn and all that stuff, but Kirk, thanks so much. Great to see you and look forward to your future success. Hey man, it was an honor to be here. So thanks, Dave. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thanks for letting me talk about veterans. I really appreciate it. Right on. Thanks, man.